Good morning. What has been spring has returned to winter. I don't know how you're feeling this morning, but it's pretty chilly. I welcome you to our service this Mother's Day and trust that you're well and hope that you're well, especially, uh, and hope that you have a chance to find a way to celebrate those who have mothered you and nurtured you and helped you grow into the fine people that you are. Uh, I celebrate my own mother and grandmother and all those others who have helped me go in the way that I should go. Uh, whether they're my mother or not, they've assumed a lot of responsibility for who I've turned into. I am grateful for all of them and all of you who look after us and care for us and nurture us in so many ways. And I trust that winter will pass this Blackberry winter and we will get to spring again and I will get to uncover my tomatoes and, and things will progress on. But I welcome you to this service and, and hope that we can celebrate together this morning as we share in worship with one another, again, apart from the building, but hopefully that's going to change soon. I, I hear rumblings that there may be some relaxation of the mandate that's got us uh, out of the church building, and uh, we will see. We will see. We'll we'll do whatever we need to do, and the bishop and cabinet will let us know. So I welcome you this day, and and uh, I invite you now to to share in prayer with me. God, we do thank you for the gift of this day for the blessing of life and the, the opportunity to live it in relationship to you through Christ. Because we know, O oh God, that what you offer in him, through him, with him, is incredible living, incredible life. Bless our church as we worship apart from one another, as we celebrate one another and remember one another. God, help us to to continue to seek joy in our living and to be, uh, to be loving in all that we do. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are not well. We pray that their journey will be an easy one, that your presence with them will bring them to the place that they need to be, wherever that is. God, we trust your will for our lives and for our church, for our world. And we pray that we can respond to your call into that will in all things, that we seek you and we open ourselves up to you and what you have for us as your hands and feet in this place. Bless us, God, as we worship this day. Give us your, your love and care in your presence through the Christ who, who gave so much for us. We are grateful for life and love lived in him and in you through him. God, keep us in your love always. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask you to remember the family of Josie Butler and, and the family of Alan Price. As uh, Alan is passed and we know that there's going to be a funeral at a later date, keep Susan and her family in your prayers. And Josie, at this point that we're recording this, is very near death, and we celebrate her and remember her as uh, her journey continues into the presence of God. Keep these people in your prayers. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this service.
Hello, children of Beaver Ridge. I hope you've had a great week again. I hope you have enjoyed some beautiful weather and gotten outside and done lots of fun things. I hope you remembered to say your prayers, take your vitamins, and wash your hands. Um, but this week we're having a special week. It's a special day today. So for that, we have an activity I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes for a second. And I want you to think of a woman in your life that has spent more time helping you than any other person. All right, I'll give you a second to think about that. All right, you know who I thought of? I thought of my mom. I also thought of my wife and all the work she does with my kids. Did you think of your mom? Probably most of us did. Or you could have thought of your stepmom, your foster mom, your grandmother, your aunt, maybe a friend or a teacher. So today we celebrate all the women in our life that take on that role of a mother for us. And we, we want to say thank you today. I know especially I want to say thank you to my mom and my wife and my mother-in-law for all that they do. And so, in thinking about Mother's Day and doing some research, the Bible mentions the word mother over 300 times. So I thought maybe we would look at some famous mothers in the Bible. Now, the very first one is the very first mother, Eve, who had a personal relationship with God and was the first mother on earth. Now, imagine that. Most of the time now, when women have a baby and they become a new mom and they have questions, there's books and there's their own mothers they talk to and other people they know they've had kids. Eve was the first one. You know, she was the first one that had to potty train somebody and the first one that had to go through teething and all these new experiences. And she didn't have anybody there to ask questions to. She didn't have any other mothers to talk about. She was sort of in our aspect, all on her own with that. She just had Adam and God with her, but all these experiences, she was the first one. And it was her job to pass on uh, her, to her children about God and their relationship and all the things that we do. So she was sort of like the first one to figure out all this stuff. Then we have Sarah. Sarah is the mother who waited. Sarah was Abraham's wife. And God had promised Abraham that his numbers would outnumber the grains of sand and the stars in the sky, yet Sarah didn't have any kids. She hadn't had any children yet, and she didn't know what the God was talking about. And when Sarah was 90 years old, an angel of the Lord came to her and told her that she was going to have a son, and she laughed. because She was old. She's like, I'm too old for that. But then God blessed her with a child, and she gave birth to Isaac. Now, the next mother we're going to talk about happens to be Isaac's wife, Rebecca. Rebecca was the mother who believed when she was pregnant with twins, God came to her in a dream and told her that of her two children, they would both raise up a great nation, but the younger would be in charge. The older would serve the younger. And Rebecca believed that. And through some personal choices, she helped make sure that her youngest son, Jacob, got the birthright from Isaac instead of her older son, Esau. But they both became great nations. Then we have Jochebed. Now, it's not a name we say a lot, but her story is oh so important. She was an Israelite, a Hebrew, living in Egypt at the time. And the Pharaoh got nervous that the numbers of the Hebrews were growing and growing. And so he set out a, a de declaration that all the baby boys were to be executed. And she was pregnant at the time. So she hid. And where a baby was born, she hid as long as she could. And where a baby was about three months old, and she knew she couldn't hide him any longer... She decided to make a choice to save her child. 
she decided to give her baby up for his safety. So she made a basket and placed their baby in the basket and floated it down the river to where some women were. And one of these women happened to be the Pharaoh's daughter. The Pharaoh's daughter found this baby and took him into her house and adopted him. But she needed help. And so she asked around, and it just so happened, Jochebed's daughter Miriam said, I know someone that could help take care of the baby. And she brought the baby back to Jochebed. So she, God, seeing her willingness to sacrifice and, and do what she did for the safety of her child, let her have him back for a time. And she nursed him, and she took care of him until he went to live with the Pharaoh. And that baby grew up to be Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. Then you have Hannah, the mother who waited. Again, a woman who didn't have any children and didn't think she could, and she prayed to God, and she said, If you'll give me a child, Lord, I will give him back to you. Please. And the Lord heard her prayers and granted her wish, and she had a baby. And when he was old enough, she brought him to the temple to live and to train and to be a priest, and he became Samuel, a great prophet of the time, who even canceled the first kings of Israel, King Saul and King David. Then much later on, we have Elizabeth, a mother who believed. Again, she was one of those mothers that was older and didn't think that she would ever have a child. And an angel appeared to her husband and said, you are going to have a child, and this child will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he couldn't believe it. Even he laughed. And she became pregnant at an older age. And she had a baby that became John the Baptist. And he led the way for Jesus to come and preached and was known throughout the land. And then we have Mary, a mother blessed among women. Can you imagine being the chosen mother to Jesus. That's not any pressure, right? God's just going to tell you, you're going to be the mother of my son, and he's going to save the world. And so there's Mary, a very young age, she's going to have Jesus, and she has him in a manger in a stable. And then much later on, you hear about them traveling into Jerusalem and the temples and visiting family on their way back. She can't find Jesus. And they go, and at 12, he's preaching to people at the temple, and Mary says, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm doing my father's work. And she knows she has to foster that with Jesus. She has to make sure he has, you know, the roof over his head, the food on his table, the love and the knowledge that he has. And then later on, Jesus is at a wedding. And I always like this story when it comes to moms. Jesus is at a wedding, and they run out of wine. They run out of stuff to drink. And Mary goes, Jesus, what can you do? And he looks at her and goes, woman, my time has not come yet, saying, well, it's not time for me to start this journey. And she just looks at the people that are working at the wedding and just says, do whatever he tells you to do. Now, Jesus could have said, no, I said it's not my time, and that was it. But the story goes on that Jesus then said, Okay, give me those barrels and fill them up with water. And he turned the water into wine. And I always have found that a little amusing that Jesus listened to his mom. And even though maybe he didn't quite want to do it, he still did what his mama told him to do. And one of the more powerful things, you know, Easter wasn't that far away. We know what Jesus did on that day. He died for our sins. But when he's on the cross, one of the last things he does is he looks at his mother and he looks at who they described as the disciple that he loved, one of his closest friends and confidants, and goes, look, there's your son. And look, there's your mother. Basically saying, I'm not going to physically be around anymore I need you to take care of my mother. So even Jesus' last thoughts are, I need someone to take care of my mother. She has been there for me this whole time. I need to make sure people are there for her. And I think that says a lot. The Bible in Psalms also says this about mothers. 
Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children will rise up and call her blessed. Her husband will praise her and say, Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. It's also one of the commandments to honor your mother. And honoring means having a right attitude about someone and showing their importance in how you act. So today, I, want, I challenge you to truly spend time honoring your mother with your gifts and your presence. And you may say, well, Travis, gifts and presents are the same thing. No, no. You may have given her a gift, and that's wonderful, and I think you should. But your presence is different than your presence. Your presence is, I want you to really be with your mom today. Spend time with her. Set aside the stuff you want to do. Ask her what she wants to do. Just be in the same room with her. Just hang out with your mom. She loves you so much, and she is constantly thinking about you and worrying about you and trying to make sure that you're safe and loved and taken care of. And, you know, it doesn't matter if we're 5 or 8 or 13 or 24 or 38 or 52. If your mother is alive, she is always going to be there to love and take care of you, and she's always going to worry about you. So today is the day that we truly give to her and say thank you for that. And so from the Children's Department of Beaver Ridge and Beaver Ridge United Methodist Church to all the mothers and women who take on that role, we honor you and we appreciate all that you do for us. And we are blessed to have you. And I'd like us to close in prayer. Dear God, I pray for all the mothers that we know. I pray you bless them with health, wisdom, and peace. Bless the new mothers-to-be. Bless the mothers that are juggling all the things and all the needs of their children. Bless the mothers who have children with special needs. Bless the mothers that have adopted or given up children to adoption. Bless those mothers that are waiting to be mothers in other sort of forms, or bless those women that take on that motherly role. Bless the mothers of children who are grown and have moved out of the house. Bless them with your loving presence. Amen. I hope you have a great week.
Our text for the sermon today comes from Psalm 31, uh, verses 1 through 5 and 15 and 16. And it says, In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. This is the word of God for each of us, children of God. Thanks be to God. I want to talk today a little bit about thoughts and prayers. We, we know this phrase, have become familiar with it over the past few years because we offer thoughts and prayers when tragedy strikes, when things happen that we don't know how to manage, we can't, we can't do anything about, we don't not sure how to respond, maybe, but we offer thoughts and prayers. And a lot of people find these very valuable, while others try to avoid them. A recent study found that Christians generally value the, the offer of thoughts and prayers as other people make them, even if they're strangers. Two sociologists studied a group of North Carolina residents in the fall of 2018 after Hurricane Florence struck, and they talked with more than 400 residents there, asking them to describe the hardships they suffered. Then they made an offer of a thought or a prayer, and they tried to offer money in, as well. What they discovered is that Christians valued prayer from a stranger, putting its worth at more than $4. The non-religious participants, however, said that they would pay more than three fifty dollars to avoid a Christian stranger's prayer for them. This finding raises a very interesting point. Denver psychologist uh, says some people maybe just don't want your thoughts and prayers. Perhaps they are atheists or agnostics who do not believe in the power of prayer, or maybe they feel that the prayer or the offer of prayer is a platitude that takes the place of meaningful action. Even within the Christian community, many faithful people desire a strong link between the words that we speak and the actions that we exhibit. In his New Testament letter, James Wright if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of them says to you, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and you, yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? Faith without works, then, in this understanding, according to James, is dead. It makes me think of Marie Antoinette when the people came to her and says, we have no bread to eat. And she said, then let them eat cake. And of course, the rebellion cost her and her husband her life and their kingdom. In a similar manner, many Christians will argue that prayer without action is dead. Mothers being honored today on Mother's Day, are they going to be happy with thoughts and prayers? I think my mother probably would have at, at the point of life she was in, but she really liked a visit or a call. What she really, really liked was flowers, a plant. That's what we generally tried to get her. Uh, that's the way it is. She, she, it's a special day for her, but she likes it to be expressed in some act, especially flowers. Loving action is what is needed, and with good reason, I think. Not every human need can be met with gifts of clothing or food or, or other contributions. At times, nothing can really be offered except maybe thoughts and prayers. Think of a relative dying of a terminal illness or, or a friend going through a divorce or family member who is feeling deeply discouraged or people who are confined to their home because of a virus. 
We can talk to them. We can listen to them. We can love them. We can support them, but there's nothing really we can do to remove or mitigate or solve their problems. We can't change anything really in a, in a concrete way, but we can love and nurture and care for them and help them feel stronger because of that. I think that that's worth a great deal more than $4 to me. But what specifically are the value of our prayers? What is the true value of prayer as you experience it? Well, for one thing, prayer changes things. It's kind of like going on a mission trip. When I go to Cherokee uh, to do my work there on the woodcutting trip, the thing about that experience is I am changed more than the people that I work for is are changed. I mean, they get wood and they get maybe something to help them through the winter, but it makes a big difference in who I am and how I feel. The same is true of prayer. When I pray, it changes me. It changes my relationship to God. It makes that relationship very intentional. Psalm 31 that we read this morning is a prayer for deliverance. It includes an appeal to God. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. This prayer is all about a deepening relationship with Creator. It asks for God to hear us, rescue us, and it requests God to be a strong place for us to tie off on, a, a rock of refuge, a place of safety, of stability, a mighty fortress, a location of salvation. What it does not request is a change to the situation that's being faced here. That's, uh, that's a whole nother area. A few years ago, a group called American Atheists put a billboard upside or outside the Super Bowl on a, on a visible place that said, a Hail Mary only works in football. Then they issued a press release later that said, it's time to stop believing that prayer works. The atheists had a point. Really, praying for your team to win is is kind of futile. Players should not ask God to help them catch a pass or get the ball into the end zone. It doesn't change the outcome of a football game, I don't believe. But the American atheists were wrong to say that prayer does not work. Prayer changes people who pray, making them more peaceful, more accepting, more tolerant, more connected, more loving to our God and our Creator. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. An appeal to God. It's, it's speaking to our creator. It doesn't change the path of hurricanes or, or the outcome of sporting events, but it does change who we are, how we feel, how we see things, how we live and do. It draws us into a deeper relationship with Creator God who saves us, even as it asks for God's leadership and guidance in our life. One of the most well-known modern prayers is the Serenity Prayer, said first by Reinhold Niebuhr during World War II. It's now central to recovery from addiction. Uh, thousands of 12-step program groups use this prayer regularly as a is a source of strength and, and safety. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, and wisdom to know the difference. God is not being asked in this prayer to miraculously eliminate a desire for alcohol or narcotics or, or the addictive behavior. Instead, God is being asked to give serenity, to give courage, and to give wisdom to these people that ask for it so that they can become well. In a book called How Al-Anon Works, it says, we turn to the God of our understanding for the attributes necessary to live life more fully. 
In other words, praying people turn to God and ask for help to live better lives. By praying to God in this way, millions of people have gone through that 12-step program and, and come out to a better place. Around the world, it's changed the lives of people as they prayed this serenity prayer. In each of these groups, this prayer is said to have changed the hearts and minds of people, not the heart and mind of God. Another value of prayer is that it gives us skills to face the challenges of life. It, it, it helps us find our way. Uh, I don't know what kind of season. I understand that baseball is going to start in the summer. Uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I know that uh, a lot of people are looking forward to that. I've seen the some teams play in front of pictures of people in the stands, uh, all sorts of, of attempts to get something going because it's such an entertainment. It's America's pastime. Um, it's, it's, it's what a lot of people love to watch and really enjoy. I remember my grandmother, as she neared the end of her life, would not miss a Braves game, although when I was younger as a child, she never showed any interest in baseball at all. But she and my grandfather would sit there and watch it as often as it came on. With midwinter Super Bowl uh, over, our thoughts, our thoughts turn to that that might be a possibility in this, in this game. But as we look at it, prayer does not mean that that our team will win or <clears throat> our team will do the best in any particular way. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, change the speed of a ball or the swing of a bat. Uh, but baseball players who pray for serenity and courage and wisdom may find the ability to live their life differently, to play their game differently because of what God gives them through the prayers that they make. They will be given the attributes they need to be the best players they can possibly be. In baseball, if you're hitting 300, you're a star, said Stephen Rossetti. He was chaplain to the uh, Washington Nationals. And that means the other two times you're striking out. So what is this worth <clears throat> as we consider the situation? Uh, whether you're facing a tough situation in a ball game or at school, at home, or in the office, mental and emotional health is always going to be an asset. When your spirit and attitude is in a good place, the performance is better. When, you're, when your person is feeling uh, worthy and, and good and positive and loving, then what we do reflects all that. Um, Eileen Flanagan wrote a book on the serenity prayer called The Wisdom to Know the Difference. And in it, she quotes a study where she found that people uh, who are able to step outside themselves and assess a troubling situation with calm reflection were able to perform much better and be better leaders in their families, their communities, their job. They recast a crisis as a problem to be addressed a puzzle to be solved, and they take action in these situations, they can control and accept the inability to do so when matters are outside of their control. Watching a, a report on the news this past week, I read about, or I saw about kids in the situation of the, the, the deal we're dealing with now, the, the coronavirus, and kids having to be at home, not being able to take part in activities that they typically would, like their sports teams, their, their school, their, their activities in the community, that they're really developing a lot of stress because of this. Uh, that's not surprising. That's true of anything. The athletes who don't get to take part in their, in their game are probably stressing out. They're, they're trying to find a way to, to achieve and do and be in light of this uh, quarantine we have to deal with and the restrictive nature of our culture right now, it's hard. But if we can pray, if we can get our heads around who we are and what we're dealing with, 
God, I think, will give us that peace and that serenity, that wisdom, that courage to deal with whatever we have to deal with. My times are in your hands, says the writer of Psalm 31. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. We're going to experience the greatest serenity we know when we understand that everything we face is in God's hands, that God is still God and God is in control. We can handle problems most effectively when we believe that God is with us, that God uh, is interested in who we are and where we are and how we are. And I believe that God is. He works to save us in every time and in every place, in every situation. God is with us, and, and because of that, the prayers that we make align us with the will of God and set us up for healing and wholeness in, in our lives. God wants us to have good things, wants us to live joyful in our life each and every day, regardless of the challenges that we have to face, regardless of whether we make the team, regardless of whether we pass the test, regardless of whether we get uh, through the, the virus, regardless of, of anything, God is with us. And we pray to God to keep us aware of his presence and the difference it makes. God wants to save us from the worst that life can throw at us. I have no doubt of that, even death itself. Serenity comes from the knowledge that in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Neither death, nor life, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the value of prayer as I see it goes far beyond what we usually imagine. Prayer changes us, draws us closer to God. It gives us skills to face things that are difficult. And prayer aligns us with that will of God for our lives so that we can be healed and whole and so that we can live our life to the very fullest that is available to us. So I offer you today my thoughts and prayers. And I hope you offer yours to me as well. They're worth far more than just about anything else that I can imagine. God is with us all. God will be with us until the end of the world. God bless you and keep you in his love and care. And I will be praying for you. Amen. Happy Mother's Day to all those moms out there who are absolutely crushing it. We are so thankful for you and everything you do for us that we see and the things we don't see, but we know that you're working hard to keep us up. Now, if you'll please pray with me as we end the service. Lord, thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you for giving us the gift of mothers who raised us and nurtured us and loved us, be it our biological mothers or the ones who came into our lives and helped raise us to be the people we are today, Lord. Please bless all of us as we continue to go forward, and we know that you are with us always. Lord, we thank you for everything you do, and we thank you for everything you will do. Please keep your hedge of protection around us as we move forward throughout these times, Lord, and just watch over us as we move forward. Amen. Have a happy Mother's Day. No announcements today. Spend time with your mom. Love you all. Nothing can hold us back. Nothing can tear us apart. Not life, not death. Not the in between. This is just the start. Don't let them keep you down. Don't let them push you out. We were made to live, to be fierce like lions, love and forgive.
drowning out the darkness Chasing down the dead of night We're bringing hope to the streets There's a new way of battle life Only one can set the captive free He's bringing sight back to the blind Show the lame how to walk And make the dead alive Just keep moving on Just keep pushing ahead Yeah, the new has come Set on love, we got that Holy Ghost power. We keep our eyes fixed on love. We got that Holy Ghost power. 